083. Eight Star Demon Lords. The red haired demon lord stood up right after I devoured Clayman. Excellent, then from today onwards you will be acknowledged and known as a demon lord. Is there anyone who oppose of this? Naturally, there were no objections as apparently, I had already been accepted as a demon lord long before this. I was relieved. To be honest, when I antagonized another demon lord and had a quarrel I thought I would be a gunor, it was a suicidal act. I believed that Trimaru was a guy that could get things done when needed to. If you like, I could allow you to be my follower. Ah, uh, I'm good. Go find someone else to follow you. What's with that? What's wrong with following me? Begged Ram Reese. On the other hand. Foo fun. You want to get along with Rimuru because he's my friend right? Eh? Lies. Chokes. Rimuru it's a lie right? Wah ha 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 ha. You're so unpopular Raymarys. What was that question Mark Heil? Saying those words Raymarys performed a splendid flying kick towards Milam's face but Milam deftly avoided it. I stared at the two, amazed. Fun. I don't want to admit, but there's no other way. This mistress will not forget her grudge against the evil dragon over there. But oh well, I'll admit it today. If you survive the next great war, I'll play with you. That's what Ruminas said. Since I was glared at with bloodthirsty eyes, I thought this Bishojo was going to be a tough one, but it seems like everything's fine. We approve of this, don't we old man, Dagruel? Amu, um, yes we do indeed. I have nothing to oppose of this. Tn note, it's like him, but Japanese variant. Dino and Dagrul have also given their approval. The issue the two talked about must be something major. It seemed that they were trying to protect me a while ago, they're good guys. Foo, I have no interest in regards to who being a demon lord or whatever. Do as you like. Leon said that, cold as usual. Now then. There's two individuals left. Thinking of this, I stared at Frey and Carrion. Frey noticed my gaze and stared back at me as if she were sizing me up. Is it fine? We're in the middle of the feast, and I'd like to make a request rather than a suggestion but is it okay? And such words were spoken. Rumina's butler had set the round table I kicked back in its original position. There was a large piece of table that broke, but I didn't look at it. If you pay attention to it you lose. It seems compensating for this round table is going to be pricey. I'm sorry. The demon lord sat around the round table. During the meeting, two maids came in to prepare tea. Frey began to talk after everyone had calmed down. First of all, there are no objections to accept the slime Rimuru as a demon lord. My proposal is another matter differing from the topic. No. It's not necessarily irrelevant. After watching the battle earlier, I was convinced as a demon lord, I am too weak. Even when I was fighting Clayman, we're just neck to neck. If it were an aerial battle, I would have the advantage. But this isn't an excuse for a demon lord. I have decided to become a subordinate of Milim. Milim is also very dangerous, not someone that should be left alone. I may be inferior as a demon lord. However my abilities in combat are decent. What do you think, will you accept my proposal? Saying this, Frey alternate gazes at Milim and Guy. It's not about her being weak. Rather, Clayman is the impulsive type, like a tactician. To think Frey would rely on tactics made them have a weird feeling in their gut. Well, I wonder is it because she's the scary female type that makes this even weirder? Just before Milam was able to respond to the proposal. Wait a second. If that's the case, there are things I want to say as well. I too, had lost to Miram due to my inflated ego. I intended to step down as the general. What if there is an emergency, or maybe the hero appears? Giving this loser the name of a demon lord is presumptuous isn't it? That is why, starting from today I will be the subordinate of Milam. Pleased to meet you, General Milim. At the moment, they don't even bother to check the other party's intentions. Milim doesn't have any subordinates in the first place. That's why, 
there isn't anything stopping Milam getting subordinates. This then makes me wonder, what will happen to the subordinates of the two demon lords? Wait a minute, Carrion. It was Claytard who was bad due to his negligence. I was controlled by him so I know about such things. That's probably unreasonable. While that excuse still wasn't accepted, I thought about Milim. The other demon lords have a surprised look on their face in response to that recklessness. You bastards, don't feign ignorance and lecture others. A little while ago you were. It's probably impossible for him to dominate me. I'm good at breaking free from the such things. Or something like that isn't it right? A good imitation of Milam's voice was used to re-deliver her lines. Guy is surprisingly skillful. No. That. About that. Well, it doesn't matter what happens to that muscle brain idiot over there, you're fine right Milam? Two, to have the audacity to say such a thing. When it comes to subordinates and servants, can you not speak to me so casually? Didn't we pull off the trick together as well? Hearing Milam's words, his head shook. No, if you want to, we can work together. After all, wouldn't it be more fun together? Thus, an instigation began. As you can see, this is a place where you can't afford to be careless. Well, Carrion being Carrion. Don't worry about it, but you obliterated my country. You too, have the obligation to take care of us. Smoke began to rise from Milim as she tries to comprehend the difficult words. He's more of a schemer than I though. Milam who could no longer comprehend the meaning is now inches away from losing consciousness. Finally. Eei. Whatever. Do as you like. The smoke that came out of her head was akin to a volcanic eruption, and she stopped thinking. As expected of Milam. She looks clever, but she's no good at thinking. Ha ha ha. All right. Then today onwards, Carrion and Frey are no longer demon lords. You should have served Milim from the beginning. Guy declares so with a laugh. Nobody present voiced an objection. Naturally, I too, have no objection. Thus, my ascension as a demon lord has formally been approved. At the same time the three demon lords were expelled, one was given eternal death, and the other two are now direct subordinates of Milim. The ten great demon lords is currently down to the eight great demon lords. I see, it's not the ten great demon lords anymore. In response to my murmuring, the demon lords reacted jumpily. Disturbing huh? For the sake of our dignity, we must think of a new name. Dagrul had brought up such an issue. Eh? Is this such an important issue? Fortunately, we're in the middle of the Walpurgis banquet. All the demon lords are gathered here, so there is an abundance of wisdom floating about. Ruminas made a serious Azuchi. TN note, n.wikipedia.org web link. Oi, it doesn't matter our name is. Besides, the humans already named us without our permission in the first place. Didn't the previous ten great demon lords took about three months to decide? I'm already burned out. I don't have any more energy to think tilde. No no. You probably didn't think even before you burned out. I've been thinking hard up till now. That's not what it looks like. Or rather, why did it take three months to think up such a name? Or rather, what I really want to say is that demon lords seem to have a lot of free time. What I heard, is that during those three months the name ten great demon lords had already taken root amongst the humans. In the end, it was decided to go with that name, but the needed ascent weren't obtained. Calm down you lot. It's times like these where we need to cooperate and get over it. These are the words of Guy, and... A? Eight great. And, he silenced his surrounding with wordless, oppressive silence. That's right. Now, it's as Guy said. Give it your all everyone. Raymaris restated this. Apparently not all eight great demon lords were convinced. And as if cooperation and coordination were meaningless. Wah ha 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 ha. I'm leaving it all to you guys. I have no interest in this matter. I leave it to you. 
Immediately, a few people had already started to interfere with the already fragmented cooperation between demon lords. As expected of demon lords. I thought it would be impossible to cooperate in the first place, and it seems like it really is. Furthermore, when the atmosphere was about to get even more awkward. Oh, if that's the case, then this is the specialty of my friend Rimuru. Behind my back Veldor had said such a thing when he began to get bored. TSK, and I thought he would be fine as long as he keeps reading manga when such an event occurs. Reading the mood, he indifferently continues reading on his own. However, there was someone who nodded in response to Veldor's words. That reminds me, it was you who named my subordinate, Butler. It's Ray Maurice. It's not even your servant as what I wanted to say, but now's not the time for this. But this person. I caught a glimpse of her intentions showing, only to disappear right after. If you don't insert the interlocking nails, it'll soon be too late. TN note, interlocking nails are iron rods stabbed into bones to straighten them. Well, I don't really mind dot but it's up to Beretta's intentions. Looking around, the demon lord's expectation filled gazes are now all focused on me. Oh no. The encircling net has already been cast. Winking to each other, Guy said. Today, Rimuru has been recognized as a new demon lord. I think I would like to give you a wonderful privilege. Yes. The privilege to give us a new name. Receiving such a great honor, you will naturally accept it, will you not? This is, a wheedling voice. And I remained silent, neither accepting nor rejecting. And besides, you are the reason why our numbers decreased. Take responsibility and think of a name already. Suddenly out came an intimidating tone. This is going to be seriously troublesome. Whatever. I give up too. I get it already. Goodness sake, don't complain if you don't like the name. I replied thus. The demon lords, now at ease with their face filled with smiles. They relax while I substitute them in a tea ceremony. Completely leaving it to others. Tn note, I think the tea ceremony is an idiom about leaving all the hard work to others. Well then, this guy has high standing. There are eight demon lords, eight great demon lords is probably fine, but I have a feeling this wouldn't do. Earlier. Raymarys think eight great demon lords is fine right? I was about to say it, but the intimidating glares from my surroundings made me forget all about it. Rejected. Now what? What about eight star demon lords? Even though I associated it with an octogram? Ed, I tried to think of new names for them, and ended up with these. Octastar demon lord. Star eight demon lord. Eighth star demon lord. And my personal favorite, Octodimensional Star Demon Lord. None made it to the end. After I spoke, silence followed. The Demon Lords closed their eyes, and examined each word carefully. After a while, everyone opened their eyes in unison, and... It's decided. A splendid name. Don't think you have won yet, a new era is upon us. I thought so. If it's Rimiru I believed he slash it slash she can do it. Ed, Rimuru you damned hermaphrodite. Making my life so hard. As expected indeed. Bwah ha ha ha. HMPH, I'll acknowledge this, just a little. In an instant. Wow. The last one took three months. Dot. There weren't any objections. That's great. Even if anyone objects. I'm going to make that person think of a name instead. And besides, I just heard it. What have you lot been doing in those three months? In this fashion. From today onwards, the feared demon lords will be known as the Eight Star Demon Lords, Octogram. Eight Star Demon Lords. Demon Race. The Lord of Darkness Guy Crimson. Dragonoid Race. The Tyrant of Destruction Milam Nava. Pixie Race. The Fairy of the Labyrinth Ramaries Chan. Giant Race. The Continent's Wrath Dagruel. Vampire. The Queen of Nightmares Rumina's Valentine. Fallen Race. The Sleeping Ruler Dino. Humanoid Demon Race. 
the blonde devil Leon Cromwell. And I. Slime Race. The newbie Rimuru Tempest. I want a cool second name too. To make my soul tremble in excitement, they're wonderful guys. Well, there's someone inside who will think whatever. With my recognition as a demon lord, the distribution of land was also carried out. Currently, my territory consists of the entirety of the Great Jura Forest. It was an unprecedented treatment. Phrase, Carrions, as well as Claimant's territory will be merged and be under the rule of Milim. In the end, her rule is nominal. Territory management will probably be left to Carrion and Frey, as well as Milim's people. Because there are some drifters amongst the demon lords, hiding in their territory, so I don't know the locations of all the rulers. However, with the demon lord's ring, it is possible to communicate with them. I was also given one. The demon lord's ring can not only be used for communication, but also summons a spatial magic gate. Of course, they can freely visit this place. And that's about it, which means I can come here without needing them to exclusively come pick me up. No, I can't think about this. I have a feeling I'm only going to feel tiresome if I ask this. Thus, the series of events involving Clayman as the mastermind has come to a close, and I was recognized as the new demon lord. Clayman's master. The existence of this mastermind is worrisome, but at the moment the issues from the demon side are resolved. Furthermore, I have officially stepped up to the position as the demon lord. Guy had a thin smile on his face as he observed the demon lords. Now, the demon lords have received a new name as well as a slight increase in combat power. Eight Star Demon Lords A symbol of the new demon lords, I think it's a splendid name. The distribution of forces is settled and everything has settled into a state of equilibrium. In the Great War this time, it is certain that he has the advantage. There's no difference whether he wins or loses, but even so it is natural for him to desire winning. While it lies in his degree of familiarity. According to what Dino heard, the Eastern Empire is rapidly gathering forces. The troops that was once destroyed by Veldor has begun to regroup and powerful beings are reborn once more. And, we suspect that within the shadows of the Eastern Empire lies the presence of the Scorching Dragon, Velgerind. If the Empire starts making a move, the Dragon Kind may start getting active. Things have become interesting. The pieces have been scattered on the world as the stage, the war, game, for supremacy. The challengers will give their all and participate in this fight. A way to finally relieve this boredom after 500 years. This time's great war is going to be something truly great. My own ultimate skill, prideful King Lucifer. Milim's ultimate skill, wrathful King Satan. And the new demon Lord Rimuru's ultimate skill, gluttonous King Beelzebub is taken into consideration. Three major powers with the strongest abilities, the ultimate skills, are prepared. I don't think I am the stronger one here, but I hope it's a happy miscalculation. In addition, within Dino, Sloth. Within Ruminas, Lust. The priority of awakening of the two's ultimate ability is only placed in the back. And, to enjoy things. About Shin. She already has combat abilities on par with the Demon Lords, and further growth can be expected from her. Tien note, except she used her blessing on cooking. Maybe she can learn to cleanly slice up enemies into meat strips. The bud of jealousy has sprouted. Frey, Carrion, and Shin. I confirmed what dwelled in these three at the same time. No one can predict where the wind will blow, but when they awaken it would be a joyous event. Hopefully, I wouldn't be drunk in jealously and collapse. Jealousy is hard to control, for it feels like even after I awaken from my dream I still dwell in yet another dream. Guy thought of the future, and indulged in the rapturous feeling of his imaginations for a while. On that day, the world fell into terror once again. The revival of Storm Dragon Veldora was confirmed. This information was quickly passed on to the countries under the influence of the Western Saint Church. The kings of each country, 
once again tried to rack their brains for countermeasures against Storm Dragon Valdora. However, there was a country that had a more pressing issue. Falmus Kingdom, inside the audience room of the royal castle. On a certain morning, suddenly in the middle of the throne, something was left on it. That thing was a lump of flesh. On that lump of flesh, a face was embedded on the center, it was that of the king's. He's still alive. Although he had a hollow gaze, he seems to still retain some small vestige of his consciousness. The soldier who went to patrol in the morning noticed a groaning sound. That's when he found him. Although the soldiers that served in the royal palace were elite imperial guards, they can't stop letting out scream in fear after seeing the body. Such disgusting appearance, it's inevitable if they did not realize that the thing they found was the king they served. However, the lesser cabinet minister who rushed after hearing the soldiers scream recognized that it was their king which had complete change in his appearance. And then. Th. There must be a bottle under me. Please let me drink it. Understanding the words of the king, who repeats the words in frail and incoherent muttering, they lift the king's body hesitantly. The bodily fluids linger, the stench enshrouding the vicinity. There are people who vomit in fear. There are some who stumbled on their own feet. It was a pile of decrepit limbs that were attached something that resembled a human body. The sight alone would awaken a person basic instinctual fear, a truly repulsive object. Although their faces expression stiffened, they endured it with their willpower to continue their duty. Gathering the remaining magicians in the royal palace, they had finished confirming that the lump of flesh was certainly the king himself. Even with such an appearance, they still need to pay their respect towards the king. Having lifted the king's body according to his words, there was a bottle just like what he said. But, will he be okay if he drink this? From that uncertainty, the magicians decided to appraise it. The result. Complete recovery medicine, full potion. It was a legendary class restorative medicine just a little below resurrection medicine, elixir. It has been said that by drinking this, it will completely restore the lost body parts. The manufacturing method was lost, even the dwarf race cannot reproduce it, so it was called as a miracle drug. A thought crossed in the magician's mind to use the medicine for their research, but they wouldn't dare let such words escape their mouths in the presence of the king. Of course, they knew that the only way to cure the king's current condition was by using the medicine. The change was extreme. At the same time as he drank the medicine, the king's body was transformed into its former healthy appearance. The nearest minister quickly came with appropriate clothing. Wearing the clothes and taking a breather, the king ordered to conduct an emergency imperial conference. The palace became busy, preparing for the conference. The king looked at his trusted ministers that remained behind, and said. Let's change the location. I will speak about what had occurred. Before the conference begin, I want to hear your opinions. So, he said weakly. After listening to the king's story, the ministers became silent. The content was unbelievable and was too much for them at that time. Key, king. We will ask once more. Did everyone really died? If it wasn't a complete defeat, and if the survivor are not routed, then they are really dead? Isn't the supply corps stationed at the rear? Are they safe? The king shook his head weakly. Such an appearance made everyone understand whether they accept this or not. Everyone in the expedition was dead. One of the ministers broke down in tears after hearing the confirmation. The minister who asked about the safety of the supply corps, had sent off his own son for his first participation in a war. He made some arrangements beforehand to make sure his son would not be stationed at the front where it was dangerous but at the rear. But all of it was useless. In the first place, everyone thought that they would be victorious in this war, so he was sent to participate in his first campaign. The feeling of imminent victory he held at that time? The king could no longer remember it. However, on such tragedy only one had survived from the enormous number of participants. The total casualties enumerated to around 15.000 people. This was an enormous loss, 
the likes no one had ever seen before. King. Was it true? Was the opponent only one monster? A relatively calm minister asked the king. The king nods at that question. It was true. And, the only one who survived the onslaught was me. Ed, formal speech. Again, he narrated the facts that were hard to accept. Of the torture he had, of the monster's situation. And also on the fact of the birth of new demon lord. And the dreadful future that awaited the Falmus kingdom, for opposing the demon lord. The ministers turned silent. According to the king's story, the fall of Falmus kingdom was a certainty that would occur imminently. That's why, the imperial conference was conducted, it would be held in three days after every noble had assembled. And then, the king told everyone about the three choices suggested by the demon lord. Now then, my proposal. King of Falmus Kingdom. You can only take one of the three options I present before you. The first option is for you to abdicate. You must step down from your position to take the full responsibility for this war. Naturally, after the war, you must pay reparations, that can be in the form of parts of Falmus's territory or 1.500 star gold coins. The next one is the second option. You as the king must submit your country to our country, Tempest. In this case, your Falmus kingdom will become a vassal state of Tempest. The resistance from the nobles will definitely be big, so it can be expected that it will be hard to convince them. Your treatment, as a vassal state will be dependent upon the decisions made at the conference. Although it is close to an unconditional surrender, the lives and property of the citizens will be guaranteed by me. And the last, the third option, I don't really recommend this. You once again gather the nobles, and continue the war against our country. If you take this choice, at that time your life will really come to an end. Although you might be liberated from the suffering of this world, you can protect your pride to the end. The citizens would starve, and the war will continue for a long time. You're free to choose any of the options. Make sure you tell the messenger in a week. Think about your answer carefully. With a lovely smile on its beautiful girly face, she stated it while smiling kindly. A truly terrifying demon lord. Just by reciting the words, his entire being filled with fear. To oppose such person, he never dared to even think about it again. His fear outweighed his pride as a king, he no longer held any desire to oppose that person. Turning him into a lump of flesh, every day he was made to eat his own appendages. He wholeheartedly never wanted to taste such fear ever again, but he needed to listen to the minister's words. Unbelievable! A single star gold coins is equivalent to 100 gold coins. Do you mean we need to pay 150.000 gold coins? There are no reasons to pay monsters such amount of money. I will never approve this. That's right. Moreover, the territory too. Even if it's only a territory of account, I won't accept it either. To become a neighbor to monster territory. Also, something like submitting is also unreasonable. There is no guarantee that the opponent will stick to the agreement to not interfere with the citizens. We are determined, we will resist to the bitter end. We swear by all our pride, we will exterminate those monsters. For King Adamalus, he already knew that the flow of the conversation would become like this. The nobles in this place had yet to see reality. It's not because they didn't have fear, but because they are not the ones who went to war. From a safe place, they sent people to fight in their stead. There is no need to think about the consequence when defeat came either. It was good until now. Falmus Kingdom was a major power, it was above the neighboring countries. But this time it will be impossible. After all, the opponent is a demon lord who annihilated an army single-handedly. Dot 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 is that okay? The opponent is a demon lord. This is not a metaphor or exaggeration, but a demon lord that can match against an army and overwhelm them by herself? You can call it pride, but are you guys the ones who went to war? My pride has already broken and is already gone. Like hell I want to taste such fear again. I won't permit such madness.
If you still want to go to war, you bastards can go to war, I won't stop it. In the case that we can't trust the monsters, so what? To submit? Or to go to war? Is it a good idea? I will not go to war. It's already too late, we can only surrender. This is enough, this is already satisfactory. The demon lord had already declared. If you say it was for the sake of the country, I think it's stupid to not consider the state of affair in the enemy country. If you change the state of relationship with them, perhaps they can become a good neighbor. Like that. I was warned by the monster. If I listened to what Marquis Muller and Count Hermann had said, this situation would never have occurred. It was my own desire, not for the sake of the citizens, but for myself. There is no second chance. There is none. If I make a mistake in choosing the option, not only me but calamity will pour it down on the citizens. My honor, my pride, I don't care about them anymore. At least, please think of a plan where no calamity will befall on the citizens. Hearing the king screaming with all of his spirit, the ministers were frozen. That calculating king that put his own profit as the maximum priority had personally admitted his mistake. And he ended up answering that it was hopeless after considering the difference in war potential. Certainly, just like what the king had said, the possibility for them to win was completely non-existent. Their prides were just an excuse, they just wanted to protect their own interests, and they were severely self-conscious about it. The king kneeled before his ministers. And. I am extremely sorry. Please find the best solution. For the country. For the people. Everyone nodded at that person's words, and they prostrated themselves before him. King Edamalus also gave a slight nod, and their conversation continued once again. Before the nobles assembled, they needed to think up some plans to a curtain extent. Persuading the nobles was an absolute necessity, if it was not done this country would inevitably perish. What should be done to make the situation better? What should be done for the happiness of the citizens? The discussion between the king and the ministers continued without end. Obligatory line of slow proof reading, wah ha 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 it's moving slowly. Three days passed. The nobles has assembled and the imperial conference was held. Different from the previous one. There were no composure in the king and minister's expressions, only seriousness. The nobles felt the difference in the atmosphere and tension was showing on their faces. The nobles were informed about the king's story. Hearing that speech, the nobles were thrown into chaos. This country, was defeated by the monster's country tempest. Therefore, to take the responsibility, I will abdicate from the throne. Due to the explosive statements that were spoken by the king, the conference became complicated. The disastrous fate of the subjugation army was announced by the minister. The unbelievable content was the only survivor was the king alone. The criticisms were flooding against the king's decision to fulfill the demand of compensation. Such talks was justified. As Falmus kingdom was a large country with total population of 30 million, the taxes revenue that the national treasury received each year was about 5 million gold coins. That was also the taxes revenue of last year, however the demanded compensation was 1,500 star gold coins or 150,000 gold coins. Or proportional to 3% of yearly tax revenue. Moreover, in regards to surrendering territories. The nobles were furious and speak loudly for the king to take responsibility. They demand the royal family to pay the indemnities, also they firmly refuse to cede the territories. The nobles' complaints were not completely unjustified. However, the nobles had forgotten. The opponent was a demon lord who can crush an army by herself. Or rather, perhaps they did not want to believe it. When that matter was pointed out, there are some who turned pale, but there are some who act impudently too. Just like what King Adamalus had been worried, the nobles didn't reach any conclusion and the conference was in utter chaos. King. Even if you abdicated, you cannot escape from taking responsibility. In the first place, did you think you can escape only by yourself? If this one did not abdicate, 
then I will receive the demon lord's wrath, is that fine with you? Moreover if this one don't abdicate and keep governing, there is no other choice than to become a vassal state, are you prepared for that? Gu. However. To unconditionally surrender to that monster is. He kept repeating such exchange many times. The ministers look at this situation and remembered their previous conversation with the king, their face become red from anger. King Edamalus certainly can be considered a greedy person, but not to such extent than to avarice, blind greed. Moreover he is not a foolish king and his eyes see what lies ahead. Even the mistake this time was surely also originated from his desire to protect his country's interest. To push all the blame into the king was a mistake. That was not something that can be tolerated. The nobles as always were just wanted to protect their own interest, and as for the sake of Falmus kingdom itself, it was obvious that they never cared for the lives and properties of the citizens. In the end, the conference ended without reaching any agreement. It was going just like the prediction of Rimuru, or rather, Wisdom King Raphael, civil war erupted in Falmus kingdom between the king's faction and the nobles' faction. The result was the downfall of Falmus kingdom. Henceforth, it was passed down on the later generation as a country that was destroyed because of the demon lord's wrath. It's said that at the time there came a single youth from the domain of Count Nidolmitam. This man would be known as a new hero. As he went, he gathered volunteers to protect the citizens' properties and fought against the greed of the noble class. Those who were quick of wit, as well as those who were prudent, chose to join the side of this youth early on in his quest. The name of this youth, was Yomu. Yomu was the commander of the frontier garrison, and as such, quickly gained popularity with villages and peasants alike. Especially in the outlying villages that were under threat from monster raids. The man himself was very charismatic, and in the blink of an eye, his power and influence had expanded greatly. From the words of those villages were the words that would describe him, the invincible, undefeated, always victorious. These led to rumors about this man. The disunited noble armies were too few and too scattered to oppose him, and as he went on, he began to show his overwhelming power. Not only was this young man, Yomu, backed by Marquis Muller, Count Hermann and other such influential noblemen, but he also receives the very backing of the royal family's heir. The son of the former King Edalmalis, Edgar, was still a boy, yet he played an active role as Yomu's personal staff officer. His father King Edamalus, however, was executed at the time of his abdication. The story of the former king's execution had become popular ghost talk as of late. At the time the guillotine blade fell upon him, a young girl's laugh could be heard reverberating at the scene. Then, as if by another world force, the head and body began to float in midair and vanished into the far horizon. Certainly it could not be a mass hallucination, the proof for this was the pool of blood that was left behind after the corpse vanished out of sight. Though this part of the story would be made to vanish from the chronicles of history, to fade into the depths of the void. Although in the ages to come such a subject would come to controversy and theory, there was evidence that claimed Marius, the hero King Yomu's right-hand man, possessed a spitting image of the former King Edamalus. Though by that point, there was no nobleman that could judge the authenticity of such a claim. In just two years, the young hero King Yomu the Great had completed his noble quest, and succeeded in uniting the scattered territories of the former Falmus kingdom. This was only made possible through the noble efforts of the dwarf and Bermond kingdoms. This sole factor would be known as the greatest peace that led to the successful unification. However, even beyond this was a peace that shocked the country. That was the non-aggression treaty that was bestowed upon the noble hero King Yomu by the great demon lord, Rimuru Tempest, a member of the mighty eight-star demon lords. In the end, this treaty was used as a pretext as securing post-war investments and indemnity in support of Yomu. The signing of the non-aggression pact between the great demon lord, Rimuru Tempest, and the hero King Yomu signified the end of a war that brought terror to the peoples of the kingdom. The fear of a demon lord's wrath and terror, capable of causing an entire army to vanish without a fight. 
While it isn't spoken, this pact also served to establish the legitimacy of the young hero king. With the former king dead and the hero king taking the throne with justice as his witness, a friendship was said to have been born between the hero king Yomu and the great demon lord, Rimuru Tempest. With the support of these mighty countries, a new country was born. This country's name would come to be known as Fominas. The meaning of the name was a country born through the greatest peril. Yomu formally assumed the position as the founding king, changing his name from Yomu to Fominas. By his side were two mighty devils, as well as his trusted staff officer and wise political advisor. Though the latter's histories faded into obscurity, the hero king had surrounded himself with skilled and wise individuals of unquestionable loyalty and grace. With the trust of his companions as his guide, Yomu thus set out on his road, his road as a hero king of the country of Fominas. The New Era Against such turbulent era, the progress of history does not stop, Saint Demon Confrontation Arc. 085. The Words That Reached Storm Dragon Valdoro has been reborn. This report caused a great panic within the Western Saint Church. Dot. The connection that was lost with the subjugation team was quickly discovered. They were strictly ordered to report at regular intervals, so a loss of connection indicated some misfortune. So upon hearing this report, Hanada immediately decided to set off to Tempest. But, at that moment came the surprising news of Storm Dragon Valdora's revival. Which resulted in Hanada, who was preparing to set off, to be summoned by the Holy Empire Ruberian's most influential officials. The seven celestial sages these wise men are called. It is said that each has transcended a hero class existence and is a legendary being that is often in charge of rearing new heroes. These beings are completely secluded and never appear in public. And are only discussed as legends in fairy tales and other such stories. Nor are the seven celestial sages in existence that Hanada could talk about. Obviously, they are not in existence that the Templar Knights would know about. So why does Hanata know of them? Because she is the last disciple of the seven celestial sages. They typically train their successor personally, and no one knows when the successor takes over. In other words, the fact that they all trained one person is beyond unusual. Hanata was just that excellent. And because she was so excellent she was able to learn all the skills and battle abilities that they could teach her. In a sense, you could call her a work of art. Few people from the Holy Empire of Ruberian could order Hanada around. In other words, you could even say that all power was vested in her. After inheriting her post from her predecessor, she began her reign in the top echelons of the country. Who could order her? The current emperor and the seven celestial sages. Furthermore, only the seven celestial sages can directly meet with the emperor, so Hanada has never met him. Nor has she even heard this voice. Which is why, when discussing beings who can order her, only the seven celestial sages remain. This time, she was summoned directly by them via telepathy. And she was told about Storm Dragon Valdora's rebirth. Thus, though she had prepared troops to set off to Tempest, she decided to put that order on hold. As a result, her attack on Tempest while Rimuru was away did not occur. Which was fortunate. Had she attacked Tempest along with her Knights Templar while he was away, there's a high chance the battle would have went in her favor. Anyways, Monster's Country Tempest narrowly escaped death. Was this a failure on Hinata's part? By no means. What surprised her, that is, wasn't only the report she received from the sages. As a messenger she sent to Tempest, Rahim, has returned. But his appearance was completely different. A thin layer of dirt and tattered clothing covered his body. His eyes darted, his body vehemently convulsed. He looked as if he tasted unimaginable fears. One hundred trusted Knight Templars guided Rahim into the main chamber. Cardinal Nicholas also came to hear his report. Rahim was brought into the chamber as he was. He was offered to change, but he adamantly refused. And, insisted that he had urgent information that had to be shared. Thus he stood in the main chamber, 
inside the towering cathedral in the center of the holy empire Rubarian. In all of the empire, this was the most holy and impregnable place. And there he knelt. Hesitantly, he lifted his face to confirm Hanada's presence. He seemed a little relieved seeing her there. And then he stood, his expression quickly turning into even a deeper despair. Ray him removed the tattered clothing that covered his body. Seeing what was beneath, the Templar knights covered their faces. Even Hinata looked repulsed. Everyone's gaze was focused on Ray Him's exposed body. As a myriad of faces were protruding from it. Still alive, some showed anguished expressions, others of despair. There were even some mad ones smiling. As if mocking the holy land upon which he stood. First. Behold my body. It is the punishment for evoking their king's wrath. I was a fool. A terrifying, a truly terrifying enemy I have made. A demon lord. By our hand we gave birth to a new demon lord. Perhaps even proudly, Ray Him declared in a loud voice, his eyes bloodshot. And thus he told them of the terrifying demon lord and his birth. Without concealing any of Ray Him's wrongdoings. He was not ordered to do so. Rather, he himself was obsessed to disclose all this. To free himself from the torment, to be forgiven by God. He thought he needed to confess his sins. But, surely he could not be forgiven with just this much. The Templars trembled upon hearing of a new demon lord's birth. And when they heard about his absurd power, they could no longer hide their astonishment. Before his light attack, Every anti-demon barriers, large-scale magic barriers, and even holy barriers are utterly foolish. And none have ever heard of such magic. If faced with an attack that cannot be blocked, even those gathered in the room could not survive it. Perhaps. But Hinata did not tremble. Based on what Ray Him reported, it was an attack that used the rays of the sun, she figured. And if you understand the nature of the attack, it's easy to counter it. Seeing the stoic Hanada reassured the Templar knights, thus, they calmed down. If their commander Sakaguchi Hanada did not fear the demon lord, then there was no chance they would be defeated. Their confidence was directly tied to their unwavering faith in her. The report continued. The news that Archdemon had appeared again provoked an uproar. This wasn't something they could ignore any longer. It is absolutely crucial that an Archdemon which harbors the demon lord's seed, be immediately destroyed. Besides, if it was a simple archdemon that was born depending on abilities, three knights Templar should be able to destroy it. And if they brought five knights, there was no way they could lose. But this would prove difficult if they allowed it to continue existing and accumulating experience. They had to destroy it now. Such was the rule regarding dealing with an appearance of an archdemon. Hinata-sama, this is an urgent matter. My team will subjugate this demon. Please order us. In that case, we shall also go. Please order us to attack. The young Templars exclaimed following their elders' example. The others too, in lieu with common sense, did not oppose the measure. After all, the sooner they subjugate the archdemon the better. But. Ray Him's story did not end. He still had things to say. Rather, he hasn't even mentioned the main points yet. But the Templars could not have known of this. Which is why they could discuss such pointless things as subjugating an archdemon. Please wait a moment. Do not pay any heed to the archdemon subjugation. The light magic I mentioned. As I just said, when it hit us, we were completely wiped out. However, that doesn't portray the scene appropriately. There were 15,000 of us. And this elite force was completely destroyed by a single monster's terrifying attack. I meant that literally. Not as an army, but every single individual. Massacred. That's no exaggeration. That's exactly as it happened. Silence enveloped that holy room. A heavy atmosphere in which no one could utter a single word. A monster which could massacre 15,000 men. It made them recall a certain legend. A legend speaks of a monster which became a demon lord after destroying a city. Truly, 
The monster fit the description of the word demon lord. The monster sowed chaos and destruction. Beings that exceed human capabilities are usually limited to the special S-class dragons. Currently, three of them remain and one has been sealed until now. These three beings are designated special S-class. But in reality, it wouldn't be unusual to recognize two more special S-ranked individuals from among the demon lords. The reason they are not recognized so is simple. They were mostly active before the church has been formed and have yet to produce any further causalities. In other words, should they resume their rampage, they will be recognized as special S-ranked beings. They will be recognized as a being that cannot be defeated by human hands. That's what special S rank means. As for their activity before the church had been established, that's a tale of a thousand and a few hundred years ago. According to traditional records, it would have been a thousand and two hundred years ago. Even then, two beings called demon lords and which would now have been recognized as special S rank existed Lord of Darkness Guy Crimson and Destroyer Milam Nava. Furthermore, some believed that other demon lords awakened as true demon lords, but none of these openly wrought havoc. Which is why, in order not to increase the people's anxiety for no reason, every demon lord has been classified as S-ranked. A being that can't be opposed with human strength alone. Because when a generation lacks a hero, they had to declare that humanity would not lose against demons. But, this new monster, just became a demon lord but may be immediately recognized as a special S rank. Heavy silence continued to rule the room. A silence which displayed a desire to reject accepting the birth of a new demon lord. Simple demon lords and true demon lords are an existence that towers over humans. But. HMPH, it's pointless to stand here in silence. Hey, Rahim, did you see it awaken? Ending the silence. Hinata asked. In response. Yes. I believe an offering of 15,000 lives was sufficient. He replied, confident. Is that so? Hinata muttered and began to think. As things stood, she was fortunate not to have gone to Tempest yet. If her opponent wasn't awakened, if he turned into a true demon lord, then the number of troops didn't matter. Even if you gathered powerful soldiers, should they lack the strength to oppose that monster directly then they are useless. The subjugation army's disaster only proved this point. Moreover, even though the monster hasn't awakened by then it was still capable of destroying the army alone. From time immemorial a hero and her carefully selected team would venture to defeat the demon lord. And since that's the case. I guess I'll have to go, huh? She muttered. If the opponent is a demon lord, Hinata would have to go herself. And since there was no need to further increase the number of corpses, there was no need to send out normal soldiers. An elite few. Perhaps. A hundred Knight Templar could win this battle and have a higher chance of victory than a larger force. Hinata accelerated her thoughts. Again and again and again. Because she had to ascertain her victory. And as if interrupting her thoughts a pained expression appeared on Rahim's face. And, from within his chest a new face arose. Rahim's pained expression quickly turned serene. Ah ah, test test test. Can you hear me? It's already recording. Eh? Already? Seriously? Ah, uh, whatever? Cough. Should I say, pleased to meet you? I am the Lord of Tempest, Rimuru. I'll say this in advance, this is a message. Even if you address this messenger, I won't hear you, so keep that in mind. The face said. A number of soldiers came at Ray him sword drawn but were stopped by these words. That's a speech they probably had to hear. The Knights Templar couldn't hide their surprise. Whereas Hinata's expression did not change. She was merely awaiting the next words. Her head was calculating various possibilities. But her expression did not show it. That's just how much control she had over her heart and mind. Did the messenger suit your tastes? Good taste, right? Oh, but I didn't design him. Don't get any weird ideas. 
Um this wasn't my idea either. Shut up. They might be listening in on this. Is that so? Good thing they didn't hear this. But let's forget about tastes. Let's get to the question at hand. I'm wondering how much you're planning to pay me to end this fight. I'll say this in advance, you started this fight. I have witnesses so you can't overturn this fact. So what will you do? Personally, if you apologize for this incident, I am willing to forgive you this time. But, should you refuse to make amends with monsters, then we will crush you with our entire force. Without any reserve, without any mercy, without a second thought we shall crush you. Eh? Even if a time to rethink this comes up? Didn't I tell you to shut up? What will you do if they hear you? I won't look cool anymore. Which is why, I ask you to carefully consider the next step. That being so. Is Hanada there? This message will only be played if your presence is recognized. But that aside, here's what I wanted to say. Well done attacking a person without listening to a single thing they had to say. A wonderful funeral you planned for me. But, too bad. I am alive. The next time you come at me, I will respond with my true power. But, I want to hold a serious conversation before that. So I'd appreciate it if you gave it some thought. If you still desire to fight me after that, then that's that. Let this messenger know your response. The ones embedded in his body are the blood shadows I think they are called. They killed my friends so I cannot forgive them. So, I killed them and embedded their heads into this guy. This messenger is also dead. Yet I made him undead so that they continue to suffer. After receiving your reply he will come back to me, so don't worry about that. Should you decide to dispose of him, he'll automatically disintegrate thanks to your skill that I analyzed. But if you choose to only half kill him, that'll only increase his suffering so keep that in mind. Currently, I'm headed off to the Demon Lord's Walpurgis Banquet. So if you want to talk, decide upon it, and we'll talk after I return from there alive. Chances are it's going to be a week from now, so keep that in mind. Well then. I'm looking forward to your reply. And ending this monologue, the message conclude. The Templars, their mouths agape, looked at their trusted Hinata. Without being perturbed by it, she met their gaze. She was busy processing the newly obtained information. There were a few things worth of note but there was not time for that. Though he had an aloof attitude, the message's content could not ridiculed. The most important point was that disintegration had been analyzed. Now, should she fight, she probably wouldn't be able to use it on him. Perhaps he was only bluffing, but she could hardly depend on such empty optimism. Her biggest mistake was that she didn't notice his survival during their last battle. She felt a sense of regret. Yes, that rare feeling burned in her chest. He also mentioned other important things. When he spoke of making amends with monsters, he must have had the church's doctrine in mind. So he's probably searching for a chance to make peace with them. But that's something that everyone, Hinata included, would describe as naive. And, lastly, that, Monster Rimuru was most definitely not lying during their last meeting. The fact that he was also a world traveler and that he reincarnated as a monster. That, was probably true. His Japanese was far too natural. That was the nostalgic Japanese that could only come from that world. At some point in time Hinata had opened her previously closed eyes. And, without a word, she erased Rei him with disintegration. If Rimuru's words were true, then quickly erasing him would be his salvation. And. Do not be tempted by him. Our creed is absolute. We should pay no heed to some lowly monster. She declared to the knights. Though she may have just contradicted herself, that wasn't something she could admit to. That is, if they were to ignore the monster's words, there was no need to disintegrate Rahim. It was because she believed him that she did it, but the knights didn't notice it. She was the emperor's personal guard captain and led the knights herself. As their captain she had to serve as the absolute example. 
thus leading the hardened Templars was the reason for her previous words. Now then, what should I do? She wasn't sure she could win this time. Though Hinato fell into melancholy, her face did not show it. What a difficult dilemma befell her. But for Hinata, this was something she could just solve by continuing her calculations. So she thought. 